Welcome back to the Director's Garage. I am your host and resident idiot, Michael. And today, well, it's a viewer's choice. And I put a poll up on my community tab and you all voted and said you wanted to see an in-depth review of the impressive Odyssey, or do you say Audis, LCD5. I did mention I'm an idiot. Well, anyway, I listened. I, I check out that community tab from time to time and I try to post a few times a week there usually teasing like what's coming up or some update with the production or i'll talk sometimes about a shoot that i recently directed or yes i'll even ask you guys what you want to see and i respond you know you even influenced a few of my more recent purchases like this lcd5 and the meze Imperian elite so the director's garage is a full service show Ew. whatever the hell that means. Oh, gross. <laughs> kind of scary. But hey, let's kick things off with a headline. Headlines, get your headlines. And, and kidding aside, I want to talk for a few minutes about the passing of Ronnie Spector, and that happened as I was recording the last episode, while I was making the bolt and came across. Now, I want to focus in on her iconic 1963 hit with the Ronettes, Be My Baby, and I don't think this song gets the appreciation today that it deserves. Ronnie's vocal style would be deconstructed and riffed on in the months after Be My Baby's release, particularly by Motown. You heard a lot of her influence in Motown. Now, she had that incredible vibrato. It was mesmerizing and unique, and there's a good story behind the song. There usually is. In, in 1963, the Ronettes was looking for a hit when Ronnie tracked down the famous record producer Phil Spector and convinced him to produce their album. And she would marry Phil five years later. Be My Baby was recorded at Gold Star Records on Santa Monica Boulevard, just a few blocks from Frank Sinatra's reprise recording studio and down the street from Capitol Records. LA was a music mecca back in the day. Gold Star Studios was famous for its echo chamber, which helped Phil craft his trademark wall of sound. Yes, Gold Star literally provided the walls for Phil's wall of sound. The backing band on Be My Baby was The Wrecking Crew, who pretty much recorded with everyone back at that time, including the Beach Boys. There's a sensational documentary on The Wrecking Crew that should not be missed if you have any love of music. The day they were scheduled to record, one of the backup singers didn't show, and Phil recruited a young singer named Cher to sing background vocals. Yes, Cher of Sonny and Cher, who would record I Got You Babe in the very same studio in 1965, two years later. Spectre loved her so much, Cher would sing background on all of the Ronettes' hits in the 1960s. Ronnie went on to a fabulous solo career, and she even appeared in Eddie Money's Take Me Home Tonight. She sang the backing refrain, Be My Little Baby. Shades of the song, Be My Baby. Be My Baby was such an influential pop song, Brian Wilson wrote Don't Worry Baby as a tribute to the song. And Brian claims Be My Baby is the best pop song ever written. Who am I to argue, right? Its hypnotic drum beat has been sampled and woven into pop songs ever since, from Billy Joel to the Four Seasons to the Cars and, wait for it, Amy Winehouse. You watch enough Director's Garage and you'll begin to see how all of this history is woven together through the past. Headlines. And that is your musical headline for today. Before we get started, let me just say this. The world needed this headphone, the LCD5. This is the next thing as far as where this hobby is going. It's a tremendously exciting headphone. It's a thrill to wear and it's a thrill to hold. They look and they feel special and they sound terrific. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I didn't like about them, but I want all of it taken in the context of my overall feeling for the LCD5 as a starting point to flaws. This is a world-class product. 
Now I moved this headphone around all over my studio and my favorite pairing was with my Woo WA5LE with its world-class Western Electric 300B tubes and Takatsuki rectifiers and tongue sole round plate drivers. Ha ha ha. Uh, Tim Allen. Okay. Please. <laughs> That's about four grand worth of tubes, and then you got to consider there's black caps in there and custom wiring that I paid for. And but with the Sisfara, the Woo is kind of unremarkable, but paired with the Abyss and the LCD5, there is better dimension, maybe slightly less distinct sound stage, and you give back a little bit of detail. But it smooths the rough edges on this headphone quite a bit, and they gain a musicality that I appreciated way over the Fonitor rig. I, I didn't appreciate the pair pairing with the Fonitor X at all. It just came out too crispy. Now, lower power seems to be the, the key to the LCD-5. Don't throw everything you got at them. They'll, they'll respond a little funny. I felt the tubes were the right way to go, at least to my preference. It might be the best headphone I've ever heard on that Woo WA-5LE. Think about that for a second. All right, let's kick this sound check off with, say it with me, ergonomics. You know, people are always pushing sound, 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 but I gotta tell you, this is my honest opinion. If a headphone doesn't feel great on my head, I'm out. Get out. Because it becomes a race against the clock to try and get as much listening time as you can in before something starts to pinch or irritate or bind. This hobby should never be about rushing. It should be about the ride, you know? And and I'm setting this up because the ergonomics on the LCD5 are kind of a mixed bag for me. Looks-wise, you couldn't have a bigger win. This is a gorgeous headphone. The tortoise shell ring. What an excellent and inspired touch. You can see through it if you look at it from a different angle. You can see down to the metal underneath. Look, there's a carbon fiber band on top. How easy would it have been for Odyssey to, to make this a carbon fiber or a wood ring like all the other design? This is an inspired change and an inspired looking design. The other style with the wood, I feel, is played by now. So excellent touch. It's also very, very lightweight, and that's genius way lighter than their outgoing flagship. Now, one thing that I did read and I'm wondering about it is this outer ring here is supposed to be acetate. And if it is indeed acetate, don't get these things anywhere near a flame or something with a lot of heat in it because acetate is highly combustible. And I don't, I have this image of kicking back and all of a sudden, poof, you know, your ears on fire. Not good, not good. But in general, though, I love the look of this grill. I think this is an iconic looking headphone. This is how a headphone should look and an expensive one at that. And then we get off this shell and we get down to the cups themselves and things start to go a little awry. Um, first of all, there's just too much clamp pressure on this headphone. It's tight. Now, y'all with smaller heads are probably making fun of my watermelon-sized noggin, but it does fill up this space and the clamp is snug. Ouch. Then there's this carbon fiber band itself. This thing has more twist in it than chubby checkers. These headphones are in a constant state of trying to twist themselves up on my head like a pretzel. One side or the other is constantly trying to go forward while the other one's going back. And you really have to remember every time you put the headphone on your head to make sure that they are straight because one side will naturally want to push forward while the other goes back. And that's like no biggie, right? Well, the thing of it is, <laughs> it affects the tonality of the headphone quite a bit if these headphone cups and the grills are misaligned toward your ears. The bass goes off, the imaging gets a little wonky. So my warning is if, if you put these on and something doesn't sound quite right, make sure you check the alignment of the headphone because it's probably askew on your head. I'm not sure what Odyssey could have done different, but this is a design flaw to my way of thinking. Headphones should naturally align straight on your head, and these don't. 
And then we get down to the cups themselves. And like the Abyss Diana, Odyssey opted for an angled cup here instead of a flat surface with a round that goes around the outside of your ears. And this means more contact with the ear, and that's never a good thing. And I'm pretty sure this is not organic material. I think these pads are synthetic. They don't have the rich feel of some of the other headphones in its class. This feels more like faux leather to me, and I'm pretty sure it is. Now, I couldn't verify it online, but the cups feel very similar to the Stax 009S, which is to say they have a little bit of a cheaper feeling, and my ears perspire a little in them over time. So you combine the pleather and the surface area, and then you have a hard clamp, and yeah, this is not a meze-like experience for sure. It's not pain-inducing, but it's not exactly comfy. I know, I know, but how do they sound? Okay, <laughs> get into that, it's my whiny voice. And we're gonna get into that with a, when we start to look at the sound properties right now, and we're gonna get it started with the real star of the LCD5 show, and that is detail okay now there isn't another headphone out there that can hang with the resolution and the detail of the lcd5 at least in my opinion acoustic guitars electric bass toms these things are tack sharp and they are wicked fast and i'm just talking generalities you put these on and the first thing you notice is oh my god the detail it's everywhere and then you start paying attention to the nuance, the micro detail, the silliest little thing like a tiny bell ringing, and you begin to experience what the metal wall of the bell must be experiencing, or the skin on the head of the drum as the stick cracks it. I, I haven't heard the latest round of electrostatic headphones, but I'd be concerned if I were stacks. That is the one trick pony of electrostatics is that speed and the detail and these things have that in abundance up and down the entire frequency range the whole experience is further enhanced on my m scaler back here there is just a ton of information coming at you it is a total delight technically this is a headphone that pairs well with your very best audio files. Get out the DSD files and enjoy the ride. I pulled out the analog, you'll see my stuff's a little rearranged back there. I was listening to records, stellar, unbelievable Blue Note re reissues from Analog Productions. I spent an entire night listening to those classic records. It's a fantastic ride. And then we get to imaging, and I describe it as dead-on, balls, accurate, perfect. Image-wise, these things are on a par with the Susfara. I was listening to Macy Gray's Stripped album, you know I love it, and you begin to appreciate the keen, locked-in nature of what this headphone can achieve. That's a binaural recording. Everything is sorted and distributed from a specific location around your head. You've got bass left, you've got Macy in the center, guitars left, horns right. It's a razor sharp image with pinpoint precision. Rush's red barchetta, tom rolls going from left to right. It's a spectacle. Each tom comes from a slightly different position in the sound stage. Fabulous, fabulous image on the LCD-5, one of the very best I've heard. And from imaging, we're gonna roll right into soundstage. And the soundstage on this is a bit of an oval shape. I find that the front of the soundstage is a little bit closer than at the extremes and the sides. I think this is an imaging headphone first. There's a lot of space inside these cups, but it's maybe not the very widest I've ever heard. A big room does feel big enough, but it's like maybe a tick below what a headphone like the Sisfara the 1266 delivers. Some headphones, you put them on and they kind of deliver a show to you, kind of like the HD 800S or the 820. This doesn't do that. This doesn't do like big soundstage tricks. This feels more accurate. It's an accurate headphone. What you hear is what was put down in the studio. Next up, I'm gonna talk dynamics, and these are a little bit on the flatter side compared to some of the other high-end headphones. There's still plenty of surprises, I, I think especially through the mids, but you don't look to the bass on this and expect some kind of slamming experience. This is generally a neutral headphone that won't bring you fireworks when it comes to dynamics. 
And then I'll wrap up this section with instrumentation or realism. And this is one of the very best. A piano sounds like a piano right there in your head. The Sisfar is really the only other headphone I've heard that comes as close to realism as the LCD-5. Now, I purposely didn't do any A-B testing with the Sisfara. I'm saving that for the next mega shootout, but everything is so lifelike. There's zero sense of any coloration anywhere in any of the frequencies. It's a straight reference experience everywhere I turn with the LCD-5. And that experience will continue as we look at the sound structure. And I'm talking about the mids and the treble and the bass and, well, you know I'm mixing that order all up. And I'm starting with the bass, and the bass is reference. <laughs> it's, it's bass light to bass neutral. There is presence deep down into the sub, but the quantity is just a little shy of where I prefer it to be. If there's one thing I would change on the LCD besides a couple of construction niggles, it would be to add a little bass lift. And I get what they were going for. This, With all of this detail going on, a reference bass makes sense. It's a headphone I wouldn't hesitate to mix on, although I generally don't like mixing on open backs. I have a sense that I'm really hearing the bass as it was recorded with no embellishment anywhere. And this cuts two ways. Yes, it's true to the source, but a little more bass lift would be more to my personal preference. And I wouldn't mind seeing an LCD 5E version down the road where the E stood for enhanced bass or maybe a DG version for director's garage version. <laughs> All right, it's not critical. I know. <laughs> okay. And I can't leave the bass section without noting how impressive having this amount of detail down low can be. It's a precise bass, even if it's not the most exciting bass I've ever come across. Next up, I'm talking mids, and, and I freaking love the mids on the LCD-5. As safe as the bass is playing things, the mids are where Odyssey really just let things out and just went for it. There's no honk anywhere. There's a beautiful shape to the mids, but there's still enough aggression there where you get some bite. They've got some meat on the bones. This is what I call a Van Morrison worthy experience. <laughs> you know, great horns, great acoustic guitars, fantastic vocals, just a fabulous mid. And I'm going to finish with the treble, and again, I'm going to throw a lot of praise this way. They pulled it back a little bit on top. The treble doesn't have any overrepresentation in the mix, and the detail alone makes this treble a standout. Cymbals crash with gorgeous resolution without jumping out of the mix. Snare drums crack up top with precision, but again, their place sounds perfectly blended. This is a headphone that shows tremendous restraint everywhere I turn. All right, it's time to turn to music, and I want to start with Van Morrison and his mid-worthy LCD-5 voice. We're going to talk about Moondance, and I've told Van's story in the past. You can go back and look at that episode, but this is a song that usually has a ton of sparkle on top, and then you have the driving bass line. You've got Van's vocals, you've got a flute that rides the melody throughout, and then a piano and a guitar holding down the rhythm with the bass. It's a perfect recording, really, in nearly every way. And what I appreciate about the LCD-5 is the cohesiveness of all of these elements. When you put this much detail into a headphone, what I worry about is that you begin to pick apart the elements and you lose the overall musicality of what you're listening to. What the LCD-5 gets right is how it stitches all of these little components together to the point where nothing sticks out. Don't discount this headphone and what it's doing. It's really hard to do, and most headphones don't pull off a track this well like Moondance. Next up, I'm gonna talk about one of the most underappreciated Super Tramp albums, and that's even in the quietest moments. And the track I'm gonna look at today is Loverboy. Now, this is a song that features terrific dynamics. It's got 
gorgeous piano, accents up top with triangles and whistles and chimes. And then there's a tremendous reverb and decay going on and a horn section that complements the bass line. I love the construction of this song. And it's a song that's easy to derail with a lesser headphone. The LCD-5 presents it with fascinating detail and a window into this song that brought up a fresh appreciation for what the band achieved. Davies aptly describes this song and the album as a collage approach with all sorts of sounds coming in and out, and I can't disagree. But there's something missing from the LCD-5 experience on this song. It can sound positively grand on a headphone like the Sephara. It goes from small to big, and there's these sweeping, mind-altering explosions of sound on other headphones and the LCD plays it a bit safe. Everything stays coherent and structured, but I lose some of this song's grandeur on the LCD. It's lacking some explosiveness. And I kind of think it's the lack of bass presence and it's kind of average dynamics because on the right headphone, this album can be a transcendent experience. And it does blend brilliantly on the LCD, but it's just not the spectacle I've heard it to be on other headphones. It's gorgeous, yes, but it's just a little shy of the experience I've heard on other rigs. And I'm gonna finish the music section today with a jazz entry, and that's the great trumpeter Freddie Hubbard, and the album is a blue note masterpiece, Hub Tones. You're My Everything is a classic jazz arrangement. It features Herbie Hancock on keys and an excellent bass line by Reggie Workman with Clifford Jarvis banging out the beat. Freddie and saxophonist James Spaulding lay out gorgeous solos and the imaging on this song is a joy. You've got bass and piano locked in dead center. You've got drums playing off at two. You've got a sax at three o'clock and the horns come in at 10. More than enough time for lunch, I'm pretty sure. Killing me! Sorry. Okay, it's a spectacular sound and the horns are vibrant and lifelike and the drums are a standout because of what they don't do. There's nothing excessive. And that's the real story of the LCD-5 in my opinion. Nothing excessive. The word that I keep coming back to as I'm listening is reference. The LCD-5, in my opinion, comes across as one of the most neutral experiences I've had. And I mean that as a compliment. It's exciting reference, not boring reference. They give me a fresh take on how a neutral headphone can avoid being boring. They lack a little impact in places that can make for lesser experiences with certain genres like prog rock, songs that really expand out with great dynamics. That's an area where I missed a headphone like the Sespara. But I have more confidence with the LCD-5 that I'm really hearing everything as it was intended to be heard. I'm hearing every breath, grunt, and errant studio sound with unprecedented detail and clarity. If you're into a slamming bass headphone with impact and a massive presentation, that ain't this headphone. This is a reference experience. They are the most neutral headphone I've heard in a very long time. And it's a reference with detail that few, if any other headphone can reproduce. This isn't a headphone for rocking out. It's a headphone for experiencing musicians practicing their craft. There's nuance all over the place. You're thrilled by the tiniest little detail. And yet there's a cohesiveness to the way it blends all of the musical parts into a presentation where nothing is out of place or misrepresentative of that original recording. And I love these with singer-songwriters. Carol King, Jim Croce, Carly Simon, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, Neil Young, Todd Rundgren, and jazz. Jazz, jazz, jazzy, jazz, jazz. The neutrality and the speed of the LCD-5 make for one of the very best jazz experiences you'll ever have. All of the greats, from Cannonball to Louis, Thelonious, Miles, they all come alive on this LCD-5. And that rhymed. And I'm sorry. 
<laughs> okay. And then classical. Classical is another standout on this headphone. I'm not a classical aficionado. I'm going to admit that up front, but I do appreciate a good symphony or a string quartet, and the LCD-5 will not disappoint. And that is the LCD-5. It's a refined, mature-sounding headphone for people who appreciate the finer points in music. It is nuance over spectacle, and it's accuracy over coloration. It's going to make for very interesting shootouts going forward, and i got to thank Audio 46 for the hookup on these. They are the very best. And be sure to check out our coupon code and affiliate link. They help the show out, and they give you a 5% discount on most of the items that Audio 46 stocks. Now, now's a good time to subscribe to The Director's Garage if you haven't already. It's your subscriptions that help the show grow and bring world-class offerings like the LCD-5 to you. Coming soon, I have a mid-tier close back, something more affordable than one of these crazy Uber cans. There's another blind what's in the box on the way from Audio 46 and Another top-of-the-line crazy Uber can vying for a slot on that Dream Team 2.0. So give this episode a thumbs up if you appreciated it at all. Or you can do the other thing. If you wish a Sharknado would blow through and take a bite out of your resident idiot, I can't say I blame you either way, but I'll see you before you know it. Mm -hmm.